Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. What is up? Uh, my name is Fear Dragon, and welcome. Today I'm going to be talking a bit about my first premiere commentary gig at WCS Valencia, and what sort of happened with that. Kind of the story of how things unfolded, lessons I learned, all that good stuff. So this is going to be a bit of a weird vloggish style thing. I'm doing this on Twitch, and I'm probably just going to end up uploading it to YouTube as well. But yeah, let's... Just get started. So, first of all, for those who don't know, uh, I got hired to cast WCS Valencia this past weekend. Uh, I didn't get hired this past weekend, but I got hired for this past weekend. Uh, WCS Valencia was an event out in Spain, Val or Valencia, Spain, where you had a bunch of these top-level StarCraft uh, players <laughs> playing against each other. As I'm sure anyone that's watching this probably is familiar with the StarCraft scene or the esports scene, at least to some degree, uh, and knows what I'm talking about. But I got hired alongside amazing people such as uh, In Control, uh, Todd, Rotterdam, Nathanius, uh, Smix, Kalaris. I hope I'm not forgetting Pig. Um, I think that's almost. I think that's every all the talent that uh, got hired, and I was brought on as an additional person. So this was a bit interesting because, uh, of course, no premier commentary experience. I've commentated smaller LAN events such as Cheezadelphia and Kings of the North, some kind of smaller NA LAN events that are awesome, but not quite the same scale as a WCS event. Um, so it was a bit of a surprise. I mean, I had expressed interest to Blizzard before in the past saying, hey, I, you know, I'm interested in commentating a premier event. If there are ever any opportunities, like, please let me know, etc. But to be entirely honest, I didn't actually expect anything to come of it for a while. I didn't expect anything to really come to fruition until maybe 2018. As much as my goal was, I wrote a, a blog about it um, last year, I think around March or February of last year, saying that I wanted to commentate a premiere event by the end of 2017. And I guess I hit the goal, but I didn't actually think recently even that it was going to be all that feasible to hit that goal. Um, I was really thinking maybe Montreal would be my best bet. That was another surprising thing is that for those who don't know me, I really specialize in the North American scene. I know the North American scene the best. I know the players in the North American scene. I know the up and coming players in the North American scene. I know the players that are like up and coming, up and comer players. It's, it's like that, but I got hired to cast uh, Valencia, which is European event. Uh, what that usually means is that a lot of the players that aren't necessarily full time, or you know, they're they're somewhat invested in the game, but they're not really truly invested. They aren't willing to fly themselves out to Europe, or their team isn't. Uh, they're not going to be there. So that kind of knowledge that I have on those players, the specialization that I have, which I feel like is a majority of my strength right now, uh, wasn't really applicable. And that definitely got to be interesting. I have some knowledge of the kind of the European scene and the up and coming players, etc. there, as well as, of course, just the mainstays. But uh, it's not nearly to the same degree that I feel like my comfort is with North American players. So I was already a little bit surprised I got hired for Valencia, not Montreal. Um, I, I, I'm going to say this all in the context of when I got hired. Uh, I can't really speak whether or not I got hired for Montreal, but people will find out eventually. So. Uh, so another kind of fun note is that the time that I got actually got the call and got told that, yeah, we're inviting you to cast a premiere event. Like, are you interested, etc. It was actually my six year caster anniversary. So six years from the day that I had first commentated a game of Starcraft two. And, uh, that's a whole other story. Like Cyan Esports or Cyan Starcraft, whatever, Cyan uh, really wants me to do a My Life in StarCraft video. I don't know if there's actually be that much interest in listening to that kind of story for me. I don't really feel like I've made it that big yet, but maybe at some point I will. Uh, but that goes into a whole other story of um, how I got started in casting and everything. Either way, I thought it was kind of cool just the timing of that. It was also the first day that I was in Korea. Uh, I had taken a recent trip to Korea for the GSL Finals, and I had went for straight up one weekend, but what ended up happening was I arrived there, and I had some Skype messages from uh, Blizzard asking if I could talk and everything. 
So I immediately just like, okay, take my taxi, a hotel and all that stuff, uh, have a conversation. So it was a little bit surprising. It was a little bit of a shock. Uh, that also means if you know the dates of when I was in Korea and GSL finals versus Valencia and all that stuff, I had roughly three weeks to prepare. So uh, after I got back from Korea, that's when I kind of really started preparation because kind of hard when I'm bought this plane ticket and hotel and all this other stuff for Korea. I'm not going to waste too much of the time uh, just doing other things. Might as well enjoy the trip while I could. But uh, preparation for the event. So for those who don't know, yes, casters do actually prepare for events. They do prep work and everything. But um, my prep work, the way that I kind of went about it, because there's a lot of ways you can. It's a lot like preparing for a game of StarCraft, I think. When you say, oh, I'm going to play prepare for a tournament. Well, there's a lot of things you can do. You can work on specific matchups. Uh, you can try and learn some new build orders. You can try and refine the existing build orders. You can practice against particular kinds of things. Uh, but, of course, whatever you do, there's going to be things that you didn't practice. Almost without a shadow of a doubt, there's going to be something that you kind of neglected. Because there's so many possibilities. And sort of a similar thing with uh, preparing for an event. So, first of all, you have to remember, the date that the player sign-ups list was official was, I think, almost four, three, four days before WCS Valencia. Let me put it this way. I didn't know the full player list until I had taken my flight from... Uh, my flight path to Valencia from San Francisco to Frankfurt. And when I got off my, or sorry, from San Francisco to Chicago. And when I got off my flight from Chicago, the groups and the player list was finally out. And that's when I could start doing individual player prep. I think their player list had actually come out like a week earlier, but I didn't know the groups or anything like that. So I couldn't do player to player uh, research quite as much because let's be real. There's almost like 60 or 72 players or something. I think that there were, so doing 72 players versus 72 players of uh, preparation, that that's not three works, weeks worth of work. That's like a couple of months, if not a year or two worth of work. Uh, not maybe two years, but still, it was an insane amount of work to try and prepare for all of that. Especially since you have to remember, on the broadcast, you don't cover every single series. You don't get to cover every single player. And that's a funny thing about preparation is that a lot of your work is going to go completely wasted when you do it. Uh, I would say not only are, are the broadcast not going to cover everybody, but on top of that, you as an individual talent on the broadcast is not going to be involved in everyone that gets covered on the broadcast. So let's say that, for example, let's take day two, which is the longest day for the talent, I think, in terms of number of players that you cover and everything. So you cover eight series for day two because you cover all the round of 16. And that means that you're covering 16 players. 16 players of 72 players. That's a really low number. And on top of that, I think I ended up casting three series and I was on the desk for one series. So only four series was I actually involved in, I think. Um, and what that means is that I was really only involved in eight players' stories. I only weighed in and was able to contribute directly to eight players. So if you prepare 72 uh, players, and let's say even though day two is the longest day of all of them, you don't actually cover eight players every single day. Um, let's say you cover eight players all three days. Realistically, that's only 24 players. If Assuming there are no repeats, you didn't cover anyone multiple times, which is actually impossible on the finals day, or almost impossible, but that's insane 24 players and you're preparing for 72 more than a third of your work is going to or sorry more than two-thirds of your work is going to go completely wasted i mean you don't even get to talk about it in the best case situation so uh it does color the way that you prepare a little bit so doing general preparation leading up until the event so you can at least narrow down some things is definitely a little bit preferable so Things that I did, uh, I spoke with Peely Peely, Poke Bunny, and TLO. Uh, for those who are super aware, when I listed those out really quickly, you'll notice it's a Protoss player, Peely Peely, a Terran player, Poke Bunny, and a Zerg player, TLO. And I asked them to just go over the matchups with me. 
and just sit down with me for roughly an hour to two hours uh, to just talk about each matchup, what the current meta is, uh, interesting things or interesting notes about the meta, things that have fallen off, things that are kind of up and coming and weird and happening in the meta, uh, things about maps for each of the different matchups. So that was just, just increased my general uh, knowledge. And I'm super duper grateful to all of them because I offer pretty much all of them uh, like whatever their standard coaching rates would be. And none of them ended up, I guess, taking me up on it, <laughs> which was uh, kind of surprising. But I'm very, very grateful to them. But besides that, just talking with a bunch of players um, that I did know were going. Of course, this involves a lot of like reaching out and just saying, hey, you're going you're going to v you're going to have WCS Valencia, right? Um so reaching out, for example, to Namshar and Snoot and, of course, all the players that did qualify, uh, which, by the way, that qualification list wasn't even really fully complete with uh, all the Shanghai players, etc., until very close to the last minute. So doing the in-depth preparation notes on those players, uh, that involves getting research done on their previous achievements, their recent achievements this year in 2017, looking at the WCS points of all the players, uh, their region, their team, updating the team when, for example, OSC root kind of uh, split up and just became OSC, and then another team root. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a little bit unfortunate also because not only does... Uh, did the NA players not really make it to WCS Valencia in terms of, oh, flying themselves out, but there's only four spots. And realistically, it was Scarlet, Jon Snow, Masa, and True who made it through the WCS qualifier. Now, True is a Korean. He is kind of, I I think apparently I'm unique on this, at least based on uh, the reaction I kept getting on Twitter and also at the actual event when I kept saying this, uh, but considering true a North American, I consider true North American at this point, not necessarily because I think his origins are North American or anything, but I think he's been in North America long enough that he's contributed to the scene. He's contributed to the practice environment that I kind of give him the North American feel at this point. Uh, he plays a sort of weird style. Of course, he's very, very top notch, but in, in a different way than I would have considered Polt or Violet North American. Because Polt and Violet, I don't really feel like they really integrated with the North American scene that much. They lived in North America. But they didn't really play on the North American ladder very much. They didn't play in North American tournaments. They didn't practice with North American players. Uh, they were in part of the culture and everything. But I would say the same thing is true for True. Uh, and I would have said the same thing is true was true for Hydra. I mean, Hydra was another great player who really integrated himself with the scene. So I kind of consider True almost a North American player. But those four players aside, those were the only North Americans besides Neeb. So five North American players. My specialty, very much not there. Um, kind of unfortunate. Uh, that meant the North American players, the kind of cool thing about them is that I feel like I had to prepare a lot less for them. I kind of pulled up the direct results for them uh for 2017 learning more about how they did etc but it was certainly a lot easier because i didn't have to you know do in-depth research on scarlet's play style or anything i know scarlet's play style. i had to do in-depth research on how john snow plays i know john snow i know how he plays um but anyways uh, that's kind of just a little bit about the preparation work that's involved in casting an event uh, obviously, there's a lot of nerves involved, so there's a lot of cooling that off, but I'll talk about that in a bit. So, uh, there's actually going to the event, which I'll finally get to talk about now. Sorry, that took a very, very long time. But we start with uh, the way that I always like to enumerate the dates is we have day, day one, which is like day one of the event. Day zero, which is the day before the event, which is rehearsals and everything, and day negative one. Day negative one is like the day that you fly in. Uh, the way that Blizzard does the flights and everything for their talent is they always want their talent to fly in one day before rehearsals, two days before the event, so they have time to adjust the jet lag and all that good stuff. So uh, flying in day negative one, I had kind of a long series of flights. I flew from San Francisco to Chicago, Chicago to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to uh, Valencia. So it was, ended up being 20 hours of flying total. Kind of a pain. But I'm used to flying to India and stuff to visit relatives, so it wasn't a huge, huge deal. Um, it was kind of a little bit more of a pain than usual just because I had recently flown back from Korea like two weeks before or three weeks before. 
So we fly over. Um, I meet up with kind of unintentionally Todd and uh, Masa at the Frankfurt airport. So one stop away from Valencia. Last flight's like two, three hours. So pretty easy. Uh, end up hanging out with them. We head over to our hotel because we're all staying at the same hotel. End up getting lunch. Kind of just hanging out, warming up. I think all of us are pretty tired at that point. Uh, after that, end up doing some prep work. I'm trying to like adjust my sleep schedule and everything. So this is more just like, oh, I know the groups are out. So I can finally start preparing individual uh, matchups kind of based stuff, doing predictions about who's going to be making out of their groups for group stage three. So uh, for those who don't remember or don't know, the tr uh, the actual broadcast for WCS didn't, sorry, group stage one. Um, I keep I keep reversing those, but group stage one, two, and three for dream or for DreamHack events or WCS events means that you start off with thirty two or sorry sixty four players in group stage one gets narrowed down to thirty two players because top two advance in group stage two, group stage three, two more players advance and you have sixteen players that are seeded in from who who had qualified before got flown out to the event and all that stuff so you have thirty two players once again. Uh, but the broadcast doesn't actually start until group stage two. So the tournament starts and people start getting eliminated before the broadcast begins. Uh, that means that really when you talk about group stage one on the broadcast, you're not actually casting the games or anything. So any prep work you do there is more just here are the things that we expected and here's what actually happened and here's why it's surprising and that kind of stuff. So... Uh, doing a little bit extra prep work there as well as just kind of doing some extra prep work on players I didn't get a chance to actually cover because unfortunately when you have 72 players you have to prioritize players on who you're going to actually uh, do research for but eventually more players end up showing up uh, it was pretty delayed because I think a lot of people had trouble with their flights but uh, I ended up getting dinner with a bunch of really awesome players there was a Scarlet, a Laser, Probe, Soul, Cloudy, Jon Snow as well as a uh, one of the awesome fans in the community, and also a content producer, uh, Ola Rice. So we ended up getting food at an Indian place because we traveled all the way across the world for most of us to Spain so that we could eat Indian food. You know, uh, makes sense. But uh, end up just kind of talking with them, kind of getting a feel for how they were doing. Uh, obviously, in, in a less formal setting, it wasn't just like, so how are you feeling, blah, blah, blah. It was we're just like, yeah, like, how, how was your flight, etc. Like, feeling good you're gonna you're gonna wreck tear and all that stuff uh and more just hanging out and joking around uh ended up hanging in a hotel room with uh all rice a laser scarlet probe and uh, we also met up with masa in the hotel lobby so i think a couple of the others just kind of went to bed a little bit earlier on as well as soul so he was uh still there because he was staying with the laser but eventually ended up just going to bed around 10 o'clock or so so at this point, we get into day zero, getting up early for breakfast, uh, ended up meeting up with TLO, Nathanius, Todd, and In Control. Now, I am a pretty shy guy, honestly. I, in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to people, I, I really stay modest musings on my YouTube channel um, about meeting your idols and working with them. And it's hard. It's, it's not easy when you really look up to someone to just suddenly start humanizing them. Uh, I think it's in some ways it's sort of an unhealthy thing I think to do to um, put your idols too high on a pedestal but it it's hard for me uh, these are the guys that I looked up to for seven years I mean in control I've been watching him since state of the game for ages and ages uh, pig I've been cheering him on for as a player since 2011 2012 uh, probably closer to 2012. Uh, Nathanius is one of the big people that just kind of came up in the scene after a very long time. Todd, he was a legend in Warcraft 3. I'd hear my friends in high school talk about him uh, alongside, you know, Grubby and Moon, etc. Uh, all these, like, wonderful people. Smix, of course, also, you know, has been around the scene for such a long time. has been that stage host for an insanely long period of time. Uh, TLO has been around since the band. I mean, these are all people who... You really look up to and respect. And it's not easy to just quickly distance yourself from, from that kind of... I mean, again, it's it's not exactly a healthy way of putting it, but idolization in a sense. That you have so much respect for them. You, you've been watching them. You, they are, in a sense, what you've been trying to grow into as a commentator and to try and be. But uh, 
suddenly being on an equal playing field or equal relationship with them. It just doesn't exactly happen that quickly. It's something that it takes time to mentally adjust to that. So uh, I'm glad that I was able to get breakfast with them, kind of get used to that a little bit more. Also hanging out with Todd the previous day um, was good because I've been able to talk a little bit with Todd. And I feel like, for example, I feel comfortable with Pig at this point because I've been able to cast with him for my own events. I've been able to hang out with him at, like, say, the summits and stuff and some other events. Uh, Nathaniel, I'm starting to feel a little bit more comfortable with, but kind of in between. In control, just, like, nowhere close at that point. Uh, but it's, it's really just about you need to spend time with them as well as just kind of mentally, I think, go through your own preparation and change the way that you think mentally about things. So, got breakfast with them. Uh, it was very quiet, but uh, I ha got to listen on some interesting conversations. Um, after breakfast, which was like two, three hours, because the breakfast was so good. It was such a good breakfast. That I think uh, TLO tweeted like, hey, anyone up for breakfast? And Thaniers responded. I was like, yeah, I'm down. Uh, I met up with them like 10 minutes after they made the tweets because I was still getting ready and everything. But then Nathaniel's TLO and I just hung out at breakfast for like three hours. Uh, and that's when like Todd would come by and leave and In Control would come by and leave and stuff uh, because we just sat there for three hours, like just keep getting refills and stuff. Uh, so for those who don't know, day zero is the day for rehearsals again. So that meant that there wasn't really a lot going on until rehearsal started, which is almost at, I believe, we didn't have to leave or do anything, I think, until, what was it, 1 o'clock or 3 o'clock? It was relatively late. Actually, it wasn't 1 o'clock. I think it was 3 o'clock. So we had a good bit of time after waking up and stuff at, for breakfast at like 7 or 8 in the morning because everyone went to bed relatively early. Um. So we, I went back to my uh, went back to my room, did a little bit more prep work. Uh, then we went out to lunch. I went to get paella with uh, Todd, Smix, In Control, Nathanius, and uh, myself. So it was the five of us. We invited Rotterdam, but he just wasn't responding. We later found out that he slept for twenty hours. <laughs> he just arrived and passed out for twenty hours. All of us thought that we just he went to the casino or something because. Rardam's a gambling degen. Um, so let's see. After that, uh, which, oh, that was just also kind of a fun thing. Um, be able to hang out there and kind of gradually build myself into the social dynamic of these people. Because you have to remember, all these people have worked with each other so much before. Uh, they've all have their kind of dynamic and the way that they interact and converse with each other. And I'm sort of this new element. It's, it's a lot like just hanging out with a new group of people for the very first time. They may rough, like they roughly know who I am, and I've interacted with all of them individually before. I think, except for Kalaris, who wasn't at this particular lunch and everything, but I think Kalaris was uh, hanging out with uh, someone else that he uh, he knew at the event. But still, it's it's definitely a bit of work to kind of integrate yourself into the social dynamic of an, a group that already has an established social dynamic. Um, especially since, for example, like Maynard wasn't there, who I think is usually at a lot of these events. So in a way, I'm kind of like the the swap in for Maynard, which uh, was definitely ended up feeling a little bit weird, but I kind of got over that part at least. Um, either way, though, it's a lot of fun. Uh, paella and sangria, lots of sangria, lots and lots of sangria. Uh, I just kept getting sangria. And the great thing is also Todd, for those who don't know, uh, doesn't drink. So... Every single time, uh, like they'd pour around the pitcher of sangria, they'd always pour it and nobody would notice. And then Todd would just look at us like, yeah, these, these, these people. I can't do a French accent, but I'm gonna keep trying anyways. These people, they, they fill up my glass again. I, I don't fucking drink. Smix was just like, okay, well, I'll just have it. So she just kept drinking it, uh, which just made her Todd look like an alcoholic because he just instantly finishes drink. And of course, uh, Smix would just have way too much sangria. <laughs> just, I think she was feeling a little bit loopy by the end of the uh, lunch. But I think not so much that she couldn't recover. I mean, sangria isn't exactly that strong of a drink. So uh, what we ended up doing after that was we headed back. We were going to head to the beach, but I think uh, a taxi was super duper late, like getting to the lunch place. So didn't quite have time. We just ended up heading back, getting ready uh, for the rehearsals and heading over. So we head over, and 
I've heard these horror stories. I've heard horror stories about rehearsals from everybody. Every single commentator out there or talent has told me, yep, rehearsals, you're going to show up. You're going to sit there for like four or five hours and you're going to do nothing. And then you're going to go home, home to the hotel. And that sounds ridiculous to me. Like what? Why would it be like that? Um, of course, the other thing that unanimously across the board, every single person has told me is that you're going to sit there for four about five hours in control is going to make you like cry with laughter at his jokes. And then you're going to go back. So I was like, I was kind of not sure what I was going to be what to anticipate during this. So what ends up happening in reality is I show up there. I'm there for 30 to 45 minutes. And we're just kind of hanging out and I'm getting a feel for like the venue and the setup and everything. Not really having to do anything or not being asked to do anything. Really just there for 30 to 45 minutes. Hanging out in what we call the green room, which is like room with a couch. It has a TV that shows like whatever's happening on the broadcast with the speaker and all that stuff. So you can hear. Basically, it's so that you could watch the broadcast um, in a kind of comfortable place. And you have like a giant thing of monster. You have like a can uh, big thing of water we have random snacks some beautiful beautiful snacks brought to us by a wonderful wonderful person who's taking care of us that had like sweet tomatoes and grapes and apples and random bars and cookies oh god that was actually that was actually great that was what made me feel like talent um having all of those random snacks and everything but uh we hang out there for again 34 or 45 minutes uh not really doing a whole lot just kind of talking with each other and Finally, the rehearsals begin. Uh, they ask for like a couple of people. I volunteer slash like get kind of summoned to help with the rehearsals because they don't need everybody. They just need uh, three people to be on the desk. They need at least one person at the commentary desk. And then, of course, you know, they need uh, Smix moving around on the stage and all that other good stuff. So what ends up happening is I am there on the desk with Rotterdam. Calaris is, of course, there because he's the desk host. Smix is doing her thing on the stage and in control decides to do the casting. Um, so what's kind of funny is that I am very stiff. I'm just very stiff about everything. I'm like, okay, let's, let's do this. Uh, and I'm sort of taking it somewhat seriously. Cause I have no idea. This is my opportunity to get a feel for the broadcast. So if you're not too sure what, what happens at a rehearsal, we start with all, we basically just go through the entire show. Uh, we, this is also not just for the talent. This is primarily for all of the people who are, um, working behind the scenes on the event, all the people doing production and everything. So they get to test all their overlays. They get to test microphone levels, uh, camera shots and angles, all that kind of stuff. So they run through everything. And the idea is the talent will then, when it's their time to come on, they'll say something. It'll just kind of fill time for like maybe a minute maybe like 30 seconds just be on just so they can be on camera and sh test the audio levels and all that stuff and the camera shots and that's pretty much it and then they just move on to the next segment so you run through the entire show uh and iron out any kinks or any failure failure points so uh we get started Rotterdam and Calaris are just kind of being funny and sort of trolly and not taking it too seriously. I'm being sort of stiff and I'm like, haha, I'm not taking this seriously, but I'm stiffly not taking things too seriously. Uh, I'm like trying to, I'm like trying to make awkward jabs at Rotterdam about, you know, losing probes to reefers and stuff. It's just really, really super awkward for me. Um, but then I finally got on to uh, swapping over to in control casting. I think they did like Funka versus somebody or something like I can't even remember. But uh, it's just, it was just like in control, absolutely slaying everyone. I mean, so people always talk about in control impressions and in control at home story cup is hilarious, which uh, by the way is coming up. <clears throat> so I almost feel like this is preparation for him for home story cup, but something I never would have expected <laughs> is that there's in control at a premiere event and there's unfiltered in control at a home story cup. And then there's truly unfiltered in control during rehearsals. In control is pretty unfiltered at home story cut, but he is even more unfiltered when it comes to rehearsals. And it is hilarious. I can't, I can't repeat some of the things that were being said. I will say that a lot of impressions were being done. I was, I will say he is in a spot on M canning impression, um, as well as of course his red eye impression and some others, but, uh, 
that part of that part of all the buildup that I kept hearing about rehearsals is absolutely true. In control slayed everybody. Um, it's pretty great. Uh, that was that was a pleasure to to witness. <laughs> Definitely one of the highlights. But let's see. Um, besides that, lots of memes, lots of uh, joking around on the thing. I kind of got a good feel for how the broadcast was going to be and like a taste of what it was going to be like being on the desk. Uh, there's like a lot of small things that are involved in that, like how you carry yourself on the camera, uh, where you're looking, all that kind of stuff. So I got some feedback on that as well. And then we just were done, uh, which apparently means that the rehearsal was about an hour to hour and 15 minutes. Incredibly short by my standards, but supposedly it used to be a lot longer, it used to be like five, six hours. Most of the other talents, they've gone through this so many times that to them it's even an 45 minutes or something is like a really long time for them. So I can understand where they're coming from. Uh, but for me, it was super useful and it really didn't take too long. Mm. So after this, we head over to a giant talent dinner uh, with a bunch of the Blizzard people. Also, uh, there's Mark Olberts who uh, manages a lot of the talent and basically manages a lot of the production, the broadcasts. Uh, there's um let's see kayla kayla from the esports team she's freaking awesome she's taking care of the a lot of the talent and like the players and everything with our hotel situations all that kind of other stuff and she also just does a lot of work on the esports team in general um let's see artem is there he's also a part of the uh, esports team he helps with a lot of like the kind of decision making on wcs events and of course like i think he also might work on the esports twitter but i forget uh but he does a lot of stuff specifically for europe um, managing a lot of the European StarCraft WCS stuff. But I think a few other people there, as well as uh, just like general talent, and we ate pa paellas, we had more sangria. It was basically a repeat of lunch that day. So lots of sangria, lots of paella. Uh, pretty delicious, though. And just hanging around, talking with people. And this time it was everybody, not just like five of us there, uh, since everyone had arrived and all the talent were there. So finally end up going to bed around like 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. So going to bed relatively early, trying to get a, a good amount of sleep before day one. So finally, wow, we talked a lot, but uh, get into day one of WCS Valencia. So this is where things get a little bit uh, a little bit crazy for me. Um, I am pretty nervous. I am pretty nervous going into this whole thing. I... Went to bed around like 9 or 10 o'clock. I went to bed around 9, probably fall asleep around like 10 o'clock. I woke up at 1 o'clock, 1 a.m. And I'm just like extremely nervous. I just cannot go back to sleep. Uh, after like sitting awake for another hour or two, I just, I end up just going to the hotel gym. Uh, they, had, Todd had gone to the gym the day before and he sent me pictures and stuff. So I was like, oh, okay, they have a treadmill. They have like a punching bag that's useful for me to vent out some uh, stress. So... I kind of work out for like 45 minutes to an hour, um, get back, and of course you have the general in rushing, so you don't fall asleep immediately, but take a shower and everything. Fa managed to fall back asleep at 5 a.m., woke up at 7 a.m., so uh, another two hours of sleep on top of three hours that I got before, and I'm just like still super duper nervous. So I have a book, a uh, sports psychology book called Mind Gym, um, really helps me out usually, so I have a... Uh, I don't, I don't, it's not, it's not depression problems, but I get really depressed a lot of the time when I'm at events, uh, especially if I'm not working an event, you'll, if you ever see me at an event and I just seem super out of it, uh, I, I feel really out of it when I, in certain situations, like, uh, when I'm not working an event, because if I'm not doing work at an event, I should say, because usually I'm not working an event, but if I feel like I have too much time, I start thinking too much and I start thinking, man, I should just be, I should be working. I should be doing stuff right now. Um, and I kind of stress myself out and, uh, these kind of like sports psychology books I found have really helped calm me down a bit. So I ended up reading this for an hour or two. It helps me calm me down also. Uh, and I think I eventually end up I'm trying to remember. I have a bunch of notes written down about how things go in case I forget. Yeah. I end up, uh, eventually sleeping um like maybe an hour or two later get like another hour or so of sleep kind of intermittently on and off over the course of like two hours um finally wake up at 10 30 10 o'clock and go grab lunch 
after lunch, uh, which is just like at the hotel thing, uh, meeting up with a bunch of the talent and stuff, we head over the venue. So head over the venue. We go through rehearsals one more time. Uh, I learned from the day before to just try and take stuff seriously and not actually try and be the semi funny, like do it like I would be actually on the actual broadcast. But I wasn't actually involved in the rehearsals for this because I wasn't one of the people starting on the broadcast. Uh, that was kind of nice. I get to start off the broadcast not being on the. So there's two, think of it like two different stations for all the uh, commentators there's the desk and there's the casting desk. So, <laughs> sorry, reading, reading the chat. Uh, sorry if I'm not responding to stuff in the chat right now. I am actually occasionally glancing at it and stuff, but I just want to be focused because uh, this is also going to go up on YouTube and I want it to just be like this weird thing. I want to go through everything and I'm going to actually talk about anything, any stuff that you guys want to hear about in the chat afterwards. Um, but yeah, so uh, the, the, the desk and then there's the, uh, the caster desk. So the analyst desk and the caster desk. So I wasn't stationed on either one at the beginning. So I didn't need to be a part of the rehearsals because those, those are the main two that really need to worry about that. Uh, kind of got to hang around and just get a feel seeing how people were doing and how they were kind of interacting with everything. Uh, the first match I got to watch, I got to see how the broadcast opened up, which is really cool. And I got to just hang out in the green room. Um, and eventually I got brought on to cast the, uh, second match, which was Deji versus Stefano with Todd. Now I was definitely feeling a little bit nervous about this, but one really important thing to note is that for WCS Valencia, as opposed to a lot of other events, the commentators are not on camera. Uh, the desk analysts are on camera, but at no point are the people casting the series on camera. So this is a really nice place for me to start. I felt really, really happy that that was the case because it let me kind of ease myself into the broadcast a little bit. My voice was there. Casting series is what I... I'm used to doing. That's what I normally am doing. I'm casting. I'm not being looked at. I don't have to worry about these kind of weird other things where I'm on my webcam versus like all these kind of dynamic cameras moving around and all that stuff. Uh, casting in person is different than, or like, you know, talking with someone and being on camera in person is different than interacting with someone through just webcams and Skype and all that stuff. So a lot of these factors kind of get negated for my first time being on the broadcast. Uh, I've never commented with Todd before, though, and I have heard things about how Todd can, not necessarily that he is, like, difficult, to, he's not, like, a, it's not that, like, he, oh, he's such a difficult person, like, nobody likes him or anything, like, it's more just that Todd has a, a di different style of commentating, and it's harder, you kind of have to adjust around him in a lot of ways, because he specializes in what he does, and that's not necessarily the same thing that a lot of other people do. So he adjusts, I think, a lot less because he's very good at what he does. And that's what he tends to do. And because of that, he's, or I wouldn't say a reputation because that makes it sound negative. Uh, but he definitely is known a little bit amongst all the other commentators for being someone that you have to be very consciously adjusting for as opposed to he will tend to adjust more for you. Um, because, again, he has his specialties, and he's very good at those specialties. So he plays to his strengths very well. But uh, what ended up happening actually was a bit surprising. Todd was super-duper nice to me about things. And I think he ended up meeting me more than halfway a lot of the time on adjustments and trying to make sure that I could play to my strengths and everything. I think that, in, in general, our strengths kind of balance each other out very well. Todd is very good as an analyst, and he's very good at talking about certain things when he has something to say. And I'm very good at, as a, co a communicator and everything, I have to fill a lot of time uh, most of the time. Uh, sometimes when I, I'll admit, don't actually have anything super duper interesting to say, but it's about saying at least something somewhat interesting, building on previous points, and also play-by-play. -play. I love play-by-play. -play. That's, that's my jam. Um, if I could just play-by-play -play with it super duper top notch analytical commentator who just did all the analysis and I just built on their points. Hell yeah. I would be down for that. That's like my ideal commentating pair. Um, but talking about, uh, like talking with Todd, uh, about stuff, I think afterwards I felt really good about how that cast went for my first broadcast or my first cast of the broadcast. Uh, again, Stefano versus Denver. I know, obviously I, everyone knows Stefano, but I, didn't really 
know much about or sorry not stefano versus denver stefano versus daishi i didn't know that much about what stefano had been up to lately and daishi was that player that he had done well in the scene before but i hadn't really seen him for a while i had a very and he wasn't one of the players that i followed super closely um so i didn't really actually know and research too much on daishi or stefano i didn't actually expect stefano to do extremely well so I will admit I didn't exactly give him as much credit as to uh, making it super deep run in the tournament, which he did pretty decently for himself. I'm not going to lie. Uh, props to Stefano. Um, Stefano was super on point, and unfortunately I didn't have as much kind of a prep. That's also the unfortunate thing is that you move into this whole thing, and you're like, okay, I did all this prep work. I'm ready. And then the first two players that you cast, you didn't really do that much prep work on. Kind of sucks. Kind of the luck of the odds, I guess. But that's the way that the uh, cookie crumbles. And uh, it went relatively well. After that, immediately, I was put on the desk with uh, Nathanius for Strange versus Denver. I am immediately kind of uh, messed up by not having the microphone close enough to my face when I did this. So uh, the very beginning, of the, like, the very beginning of when I started talking, everyone was just like, oh, God, he's super quiet. NASL sound guy, all that stuff. Uh, and people were just like, move the mic, move the mic closer, move the mic closer. And I I was kind of like somewhat freaking out because I was like, oh, God, should I should I do it while I'm on camera? Should I just it, not care? Should I like just wait until I'm off camera? So I kind of waited and waited until the point where I thought I was off camera, but apparently I wasn't. So I adjusted the microphone. Everything after that, I think, went okay. Nathaniel's very easy to... Uh, chat with Calaris also did a great job um like kind of making it easier for me <laughs> Nathaniel's okay I know I said I wasn't going to interact with the chat but Nate in the chat right now is like yeah this guy is not mic too fucking far away. yeah Nathaniel's was like trying to signal to me but I was just sitting there like okay I I heard in my ear that my mic is too far Nathaniel's is signaling to me but I'm going to wait until I'm off camera and I, I rewatched the broadcast for that moment I did it when I was on camera anyways so really all I did was just delay things production did a great job they boosted my microphone volume regardless um they boosted it up so that even though it was super far away from me it would still be kind of loud even though it wasn't perfect volume it was better uh so it was it was kind of great but uh it was, it was a fun introduction to the broadcast, you know, already messing up, but I feel like the rest of the thing kind of went okay. I was definitely a little bit stiff still, uh, kind of getting a feel for being on the desk. Being on the desk is very different, I think, than commentating, because being on the desk, here's how I put it. As a community caster, and I mentioned this when I was talking about uh, casting with Todd, one of the skills that you really pick up is filling time. Most of the, this is the joke that like base trade and a lot of other commentators have uh, running that you tend to not really be the one that's usually delaying games. Usually it's the players that are delaying games getting started and when you can come back from break and all this stuff. All the downtime is usually because players. And because of that, you're used to just talking about things, filling time, building up stories for a lot longer. But that also means, um, conversely, is that you you kind of have this also benefit of you can have a long belabored point. You can take a kind of longer period of time to get your point across, which in a sense is kind of a bad thing in a way because you'll lose the attention. Obviously, because you haven't noticed, I'm very, very bad at getting my point across quickly, as demonstrated by this entire freaking stream. But... Uh, it's a, it's like a it's a benefit and also a negative because it builds up a bad habit. You tend to talk for a lot longer than you really should to get across a single point. And while you're watching at home, the desk segments. I mean, I think about those desk desk segments and broadcasts and stuff that I watched in the past, and it always feels like they were there for five ten minutes just talking and bantering while we waited for the next series to get started and everything. But in reality. When you're actually on the desk, you realize it's it's quick. It's really quick. It's maybe two to three minutes, if that. Uh, and it's not even just two to three minutes. It's here's a minute and a half or two, like maybe two minutes of quick talking about the matches coming up. Then you toss it over to Smix, who uh, like has uh, all the players over there, and they kind of come together, shake hands, and they go back to their desk. Calaris does his little introduction. You do final thoughts for like another 30 seconds to a minute. And then you hand it over to the commentary team. So you're 
realistic. And like, of course, you have to remember that there are three people on the broadcast now, not two like you normally have for a community cast. So that means that you're talking even less than you normally would. So realistically, about three minutes, three people on the broadcast. Uh, one of them is the host who's going to be talking the most. But let's say about 45 seconds to a minute is that how long you will about have to say your points on whatever the upcoming matchup is and everything. <laughs> By the way, thank you, Maynard, for the uh, resub for four months in a row. What a boss, dude. How's it going? Um, but, yeah, so, so what that means is that if you aren't very deliberate with all of the things that you want to talk about, this is one of the biggest realizations I had uh, that I really struggled with, I think, on the desk segments. And even to an extent, also on the casting, but... To a lesser degree, because uh, you have more time when you're casting and everything. You have, you have the entirety period of the game and stuff, and the time between the games. But you have to know exactly what you want to talk about before you come on the desk segment. But you also have to be able to adjust somewhat to what the other desk panelist is going to be saying to some extent. You have to be able to react a little bit to them. Because you don't want it to just be like one desk person says, like, oh, you know, this is going to be a great a uh, great series is going to be a really close, even matchup. And then you just come on and you're like, well, I think not even like uh, oppositionally. You're just like, yeah, I think that is a unanimous thing that everyone thinks this player is just going to win. Like you can't really do that. You're just, you're conflicting with each other, but you're not actually interacting with that confliction. You can have a differing opinion with someone. Uh, and I think Nathaniel did actually a really good, great job of this. At one of the, uh, one of the dust segments I was on, I'm trying to remember which one, um, I think it was where I said something like it was after the victory. I think it was actually after uh, Strange versus Denver. Might have been a different series. It was one of the other series on day one or day two, where uh, one of the players won. Said, "Yeah, I've you know, sorry, it, was, it definitely was like end of day one or something." Um, where one of the players won and they said, "Yeah, I feel really good. Like I made it to the playoffs. Like this is my goal." And I. I'm okay with whatever happens now if I get knocked out. And I kind of said, like, oh, you know, that's, like, you feel that way at first, but it's after the tournament and stuff that you start having regrets. Like, why didn't I keep trying all that stuff? And Nathaniel did a really good job of, like, the way that he did it is a really good example of how you uh, disagree with the person on the desk. So you can say, like, no, I actually, uh, like, I, I think that, like, you'll feel good, blah, blah, blah. And, like, no, he's going to just, like, stop trying all that kind of stuff. So you say that. And it's okay to disagree with someone on the desk. You don't all have to be in agreement, but you create a conversation or discussion out of it or make an interesting point of it. You can't just say something that happens to conflict with somebody else if you don't actually interact with them. So there's a lot of this kind of adaptation that you have to do on whatever you thought you were going to do. Be prepared, but also be prepared to adapt. And that's real. that was really difficult for me. Um, I, I, I think I... Did okay for all my desk segments. I doing one, but never the never both. Um, some segments I felt like I tried to listen a lot more to whatever the per other people were saying or Calaris was saying, or just whoever else was talking or whatever was happening in the interview and or like pr uh, post game interview, etc. And I would respond to that or build up on that. And sometimes I would actually get to say the things that I prepared, but whenever I said the things I was prepared. I was a little bit more direct, but then I would just kind of ignore whatever other things people were saying. And whenever it was the opposite side, I would be very roundabout and elaborate and not actually get to my point very quickly, uh, which I just, I could, and I could feel some of the tension when Calaris would just be like, okay, yeah, like finish up your point. I got to hand it over to the desk or hand it over to the commentators, etc." cetera. Um, so... After that, uh, I think, let's see. Moving on, I ended up uh, having a bit of time off after Strange versus Denver. So I got to hang out with a bunch of uh, players. I got interviewed by Wardy, which was really cool. You should go check it out over on his Twitch or uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com slash WardyTV, I think. Um, I think I talked with, like, Masa and Kalazor and Scarlet and a couple other players, Optimus, Optimine. Uh, just kind of getting a feel for how players were feeling, how they slept, all that good stuff. And eventually ended up being on the desk for Kelzer versus Masa, which is one of the... Oh, man. So here's the other thing. I talked a bit about, you know, working with your idols and all stuff. I had that YouTube thing, and I talked about it earlier also on. It's really difficult to, like, distance yourself 
from these people that you look up to and you watch. I mean, I watch an insane, I watch an insane amount of StarCraft and I've watched an insane amount of StarCraft. So it's that weird, I mean, it's kind of the best way I can describe it is I'm sure people, some people have experienced with this and when they go to an event and they walk up to like Day9 or they walk up to like Nathanius or In Control or uh, Maynard or Rotterdam or whoever, like, and you've spent so much time watching them and they're effectively in a weird way like a part of your life but you haven't actually talked to them before or you've talked with them very little like maybe you've interacted with them at an event before or something and there's this weird kind of surreal thing where you you feel like there's a lot you could say but the difference is in, in that situation you can say like oh thank you so much blah 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 and you kind of move along and you just you, you walk out you're, you're done some people will stick around and it gets a little bit awkward and stuff. But like for the most part, like there's there's a short period of time you interact with them and you can have that kind of relationship. With this, you don't really have that. And control is probably like the one of the big epitomes of that where uh, of all the talent I think that were at this event, In control has been around besides Smix, who I also feel somewhat nervous about. But I've uh, at BlizzCon stuff, I got to hang out with her at like after party and st like after, after, after party and stuff. And like got to talk with her. So I feel a little bit more comfortable, uh, like talking with Smix and everything. She's also just, I think a very welcoming person in control. He's awesome. I fucking love in control, but he is an intimidating guy. He's absolutely an intimidating guy. And I think there's a thing in esports where people will, people will act very chummy with people that they just met. It's not necessarily that they're being insincere, they genuinely do feel like, yeah, you're in esports. I'm in esports. Yeah, well, like hugs. Like I just met you. Let's hug. Like that's a really, if you think about it, that's a really weird thing. Hugging people you literally don't know is a pretty weird thing. But that's a thing in esports, and it's really cool. Don't get me wrong. In control though, I think he's one of those people that doesn't really buy into the whole. I'm gonna act more friendly or like super close with people that I'm not super close with. He knows, like, there's people he is close with and everything, and people he does know. It's not that he's unfriendly with those people he doesn't know, but he doesn't act more friendly than he normally would in a normal social environment. Um, like, for example, like, I, I would probably be the, like, if I meet in control at another event, like, I wouldn't say I'm so close that I would probably hug him. I'd probably do the handshake thing, like, hey, or I'd do, like, the nod and stuff. So, uh, he's a bit of an in intimidating guy. And of course I've been watching him longer than almost all the other people. So, uh, this is my first death segment on, uh, with in control. First time being with in control on the broadcast. So uh, with Kelzer versus Masa. And of course you also think about all the, the witty banter that in control can dish out, how on point he can be and how intimidating that can be. Oh my God. It's in a much nicer way, obviously, I don't mean this in like a, a mean way or anything. Like, it's not, it's not like making the person, the reason why I was up until five in the morning, like trying to overcome my nerves because I thought he was just going to bully me or something. But like, it's scary, man. He can, he can be savage on uh, some of the broadcasts and everything. If you watch how he, uh, how he banters with a lot of uh, other people and the talent. Now he's very comfortable with them. And that's the thing. Um, I kind of knew to some extent I figured that he would be a bit nicer to me, but he was exceptionally nice to me. I think he was very easy on me. He could probably sense that I was feeling pretty nervous. So really didn't give me almost at all of a hard time. I think at most, like, kind of said, like, yes, yes, Ruffy. That's that's the case. Like, I think I was, like, the because I, I said something, like, super obvious or something. Um, but for the most part, it was pretty straightforward and easy. And he was super uh, easy to work with. It was fun. Um, I still think I didn't do a great job on the desk, but what can you do? So we close out. I'm all closing out for the day, which was really cool. That was a nice little surprise I didn't expect. So I get to talk about the groups. I get to talk about uh, some of the prep work that I actually did. Yeah, nice. I get to use my notebooks. Um, talk about, uh, I can't remember, Showtime being knocked out. Uh Probe making out of his group 4-0, uh, which I was super excited about. I'm a huge... <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a huge probe fan. Um, I'm getting over a fever and a cold and a cough right now. So forgive me if I start coughing or sniffing. Um, but probe is awesome. And I was super duper happy for him 
uh, being able to make it to the playoffs. And we found out that he did some even more awesome stuff the next day. But uh, yeah, so that was the end of day one. Everyone ends up, uh, all the talent ends up heading back afterwards. And so we, uh, not everybody, but a bunch of people. I think it was, let's see. Smix, Nathanius, In Control, Roddy, myself, maybe one other person. Ah, oh, shit. Hope I'm not forgetting anyone. It wasn't, it, Pig, Calaris, and Todd went to bed. I think the rest of us just kind of hung out at the hotel bar and had like a couple of like some light drinks, like one or two. Uh, nothing super extreme. But we ended up just, like, talking about StarCraft, the scene. Oh, excuse me. That cold's still catching up with me. Um, We ended up just talking about StarCraft and the scene and everything that's going on. I don't want to talk too much about that stuff. Uh, as awesome as it would be to talk about, like, that was those are some very private conversations. Um, So not really something I'm really looking to dive too deeply into. Uh, definitely really cool though it's those are like the conversations that i'm used to having like if i'm going to interact with those people it's usually like that kind of setting where it's at a hotel bar or you know some after party or something and we're all just talking about starcraft uh which is always a bit of fun but we end up eventually heading to bed um honestly a, a little bit late on in, into the night uh but the kind of cool thing is that even though i end up sleeping maybe around like i would say one or two so pretty late actually maybe like closer to two uh stayed up a lot later than i thought we would just talking but the cool thing about it was that i had a lot of trouble sleeping the day before i mentioned this uh i w probably got like four or five hours of sleep on uh days day one or day zero whatever you want to call it and day two i slept like a baby because i had a couple of drinks which always helps and I didn't have so much that I would, like, mess up my voice or anything. Um, but then we also went to bed kind of late after a long day. So I slept really well. So uh, woke up or woke up at 9 a.m., went to uh, – got breakfast and then head to the venue. Uh, I think that they asked, like, if we had any interest on, like, oh, do you want to cast more? Do you want to do des more desk segments? They asked everybody about this. Um, but let's see. What ended up happening was I – Said that I wanted to cast more because I think that's where I felt more comfortable. And as much as I would like to have more experience on the desk, I really just want... It was getting into, like, day two and there was the playoffs and everything. I wanted to do... Focus more on just, like, doing a good job and everything. And sticking to some of my strengths. And also, I think casting, I just enjoy. I just enjoy being part of the games and stuff, so... Uh, end up casting the first series of the day, I think. Uh, Stefano versus Nurcio. End up casting with Pig. I've casted with Pig before. And uh, I think it w goes relatively well. Stefano not really putting up as much of a fight as a lot of people were hoping he would. Rotterdam was really, really hopeful. But ends up not really working out. Um, so also, someone was asking in the chat. Uh, Steady Goa asking what my drink of choice was. It was just, just a beer. Light beer. I didn't want to have anything super hard alcohol-wise. Uh, but yeah, so we end up... Uh, casting that series, it goes relatively okay. It's a ZVZ, so you know. And I want I want to note really quickly. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't even talk about this before. Uh, yesterday, the day before, day one, I also got to cast Haas versus Special, which was super duper interesting because oh my god, that Haas is of course absolutely crazy. Special kind of stomped on him, but there was some glimmers of hope that it was going to be this super duper exciting series. I also got to cast him with Thanius, which was awesome. Uh, I have never casted Nathanius before either, but he's actually super easy to cast with. So that felt good, Nathanius. I think I felt a little bit bad. I felt like I kind of held him back because, in retrospect, it was day one. That's kind of when that's kind of when you gotta you meme the most and you joke around the most. And I feel like, especially in a series like Haas versus anybody, that's when that's when you tell the jokes. That's when you meme around. And I feel like I kind of held Nathanius back in that because I was still a little bit stiff. But, uh, but I had casted. Daishi versus Tavano, which is a TVZ. I casted Haas versus Special. So I finally, I did get a one Protoss matchup uh, versus Terran. But it was Haas, so if you even consider him Protoss. And then I cast a ZVZ on day two. So here's the thing. 
day two, I end up casting Stefano versus Nurcio. And then I end up casting Stute versus Scarlet. And those are the like the two series. I think I cast I think I cast three series. Hold on. Stefano Nurcio. Scarlet Snoot. I really thought I had cast three series, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyways, uh general idea was that I pretty much for the entire rest of the event only cast ZVZs. Which sort of sucked for me. I just cast I ended up just casting three ZVZs for the rest of the event. Uh because I'm a Protoss player and my specialty is really like Protoss matchups, but when you're on a talent lineup with In Control, who's a Protoss GM Protoss player, Rotterdam, who's a GM Protoss player, Todd, who's a GM Protoss player, and then Nathanius is a GM Terran player, Pig is a GM Zerg player, and then there's me, Diamond Protoss player. I'm like, okay, I don't really get a whole lot of say in the matchups that I get to cast. Uh, but, you know, I get to do the play by play and everything. And I usually get paired up with somebody who knows the matchup and stuff. So I think there was only one time I got paired up with... Who was it? I think I got paired up for a ZVZ with Todd at some point. Oh, yeah. Deshi uh, versus... No. Deshi versus Stefano was a ZVT where it was two Protoss players casting a ZVT. But uh, besides that, it was mostly casting a lot of Zerg versus Zergs, which kind of sucked. Uh, the help that... The preparation that TLO had given me was really helpful, but... I think also it's is a little bit. I won't say frustrating, because that frustrating. I feel like frustration is usually vented at somebody, and I didn't really feel frustrated with anybody. I think it made a lot of sense. Like in a sense, I I kind of was the intern on the broadcast. Uh, I was gonna have last pick and all that stuff. And for example, like I walked in uh, like three weeks beforehand. I was like, I know that I'm not casting the finals. Like I will actually be a little bit surprised if I even get to cast the semifinals. Like, that would be cool. Uh, or maybe I'd just be on the desk for it or something. But I'll talk about that uh, for day three in a little bit. Uh, I'll, I'll try and speed things up. This is definitely getting a little bit on the long side. It was uh, certainly very interesting, though. And it, it kind of sucked, but that's sort of life. And I think you just got to take it as it comes. I know I got some feedback because uh, I... I usually don't check Reddit and all that stuff. And I, I was very good. I didn't check it at all during the event. And I didn't check Team Liquid uh, during the event for the most part. Like, for the, the, what people were saying about anything that I had to do with anything um, until very later. But I definitely know I got some feedback because I checked it later on. Narcissism can't keep me down. Well, narcissism actually can keep me down. But uh, <laughs> um, eventually we overweighed my desire to not be involved in anything and I saw that a lot of people were kind of criticizing my knowledge of the game and it's kind of a little bit frustrating because ZBZ I feel like definitely is something that is a bit of a mess to cast sometimes but still absolutely going to be some room for improvement so um, I was on the desk for another series Monster vs. Kelazor with Todd I got to watch some other series from the green room and just like talk with other people while the uh, series are going on, but uh, Scarlet versus Snoot was like the the big series that I was actually really excited for. I was well prepared for it. I had written a bunch of notes for Snoot. I talked with Snoot a bunch. I had written a bunch of notes for Scarlet. I talked with Scarlet. Uh, I felt really prepared for that matchup, and I had also like watched a bunch of Snoot ZVZs recently. Um, Scarlet and ZVZ I hadn't watched as much of recently, but I had a general idea of it. So, we go into the series. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit tired now because as much as it was helpful that I was able to get a straight up sleep, uh, I think not getting a lot of sleep the day before because I was just nervous and not getting a lot of sleep that day was starting to catch up with me. So I'd basically been operating on maybe uh, nine hours of sleep over the course of two days, which isn't great, but this is like now hitting around pretty late in the day, like seven, eight o'clock or something PM. And I've been up since pretty early. So I uh, started to feel a little bit tired. Game one goes by okay. But then as soon as game one finishes, there's like this huge delay. Um, this really, really long delay between the games. And it ends up being, I think like 10 to 12 minutes or something of just filling time. And Pig and I are just sitting there, like, trying to fill time, trying to talk about stuff. And it kind of sucks because 
And I use up a lot of my big talking points pretty early on. Excuse me. And it it really ends up, uh, I think, kills the momentum in a lot of ways. Not necessarily in terms of, uh, you know, how the games are going on and stuff, but, like, I think that combined with, like, just feeling tired. I started making a lot of really dumb mistakes. Like, Pig would say something, and then 10 seconds would pass, and I'd, like, say something. Like, I, I think the big example was uh, in game, uh, like, the game on uh, Proxima Station. I think Scarlet was pushing into Snoot's, uh, like, third uh, third base or something and she snipes off a roach where i'm like oh my god Snoop can't make roaches anymore or something like that maybe the players are reversed something uh and 10 seconds earlier pig had just said like oh man Snoop's making a second roach war and like there's already a second roach war in the main base or something and i just like didn't hear it or something so i don't know I, that definitely got a little bit frustrating uh i got frustrated with myself and I kind of knew what ended up happening, and I knew that I was doing a really shitty job. I think afterwards, immediately, I kind of said, I, like, turned to Pig, and I was like, hey, I'm sorry, man. Like, I, I just felt so super off. I felt like that was a really shitty job on my part. And this is before I, like, read any of the feedback. Or I didn't even know about that specific Roach War thing. I just, like, I could feel that it was really not my best cast. Uh, kind of apologize to him. But, uh, excuse me. Oh, God. This nose. Ugh. Apologize again. I'm getting over here being sick. But what ended up happening was uh, Pig was just he was super nice about it. He was like, yeah, don't worry about it. I think, you know, we kind of just didn't mesh very well together in that thing. But that's fine. We'll get it right next time. So that was the last thing that I had to do for the day. So I uh, ended up just watching Pro vs. Deeb. Uh, sorry if I had to start talking nasally. My nose is like super clogged. And uh, ended up going to bed a little bit earlier because I was I was tired and I also didn't want to stay up too late again um, for day two. I think everyone else sort of felt the same way. So I went to bed around 11 p.m. So like two in the morning this time. But unfortunately, I think I psyched myself out a little bit. I fell asleep probably around midnight and I woke up around five, which isn't terrible because just because I was tired. So I was able to sleep some, but, uh, it's not exactly great. Five hours of sleep. And I, I tend to be pretty hard on myself when I feel like I make mistakes. And it's something that I really need to work on just like bouncing back. I'm, I'm definitely like the guy in D like the, the example I always like to use is DDR where you make a mistake in DDR or like a set mania or whatever any of those rhythm games or Guitar Hero, when you make one mistake, theoretically, that one mistake shouldn't affect any of the follow-up notes, but it, it almost always does. You make one mistake, and then just it causes this like collapse of you try and play catch-up on that note that you missed, even though it's already gone, and then, you tr then you're late for the next one, and then that mistake causes another one. So and you have to like really just focus in and reset as quickly as possible before too many mistakes happen. And that's something I'm still working on and something that I definitely think I struggled with. So after I kind of made those mistakes on day two, I was feeling really down. I was really, really just like not in a good place. Uh, so I woke up around 5 a.m. feeling really nervous. And I just I ended up reading Mind Gym again, the uh, sports psychology book for another two hours, calm myself down. Uh, and I couldn't sleep. I just, I just prepared for the remaining time, which, uh, kind of sucked. Cause now I was on five hours of sleep again. Uh, just sort of needing to take time to like calm myself down really took away from, I think, uh, my rest, my mental state, which is just like a weakness for me to overcome, I guess. Uh, but it is what it is. It's just something to work on for later. Uh, so I got breakfast with Masa, Cyril, and Artem. Masa was already knocked out. Cyril was still in the tournament at this point. It was around eight. Uh, Artem, of course, the esports guy for Europe. Super awesome. And uh, got to, it was kind of cool talking with Cyril and stuff and uh, feel for like what he was uh, going to say and how he felt about coming to the day. I think he predicted a 3-1 versus true and stuff. So I got some cool little quotes out of him, which is nice. Uh, let's see. 
catch of the venue, end up casting Sterile versus True, which was super awesome. True upset. I'm huge. I really like True. I know there are some people who are like, oh, faceless crayon stuff, but True is awesome. I, I love True. Um, and I was super duper happy for him because I think a lot of people weren't really expecting a lot coming into that. And a lot of people just underestimate True. They just really sleep on True. But True is a lot like Pult in a lot of ways. Uh, he shows up to the w big WCS events and stuff, but he doesn't do as well on the ladder. He gets actually crushed on the ladder by a lot of much worse players. Um, and because of that, he plays on EU and stuff, and Serral just didn't have a lot of respect for him. A lot of the European players don't really have a lot of respect for him. Now, uh, to be fair, a laser ends up crushing True later on pretty one-sidedly, but still, I was uh, very happy for True being able to beat Serral. Uh, I got to watch a laser versus Nurchio. I was on the desk for Kelzer Snoot with Pig. That was fun. Again, didn't really feel like I did a great job with that. Uh, the cast versus of Serral versus True, I think, went okay. I still made a lot of mistakes. And just, like, I would say things and think, why did I say that? That kind of stuff. Uh, which kind of fed into, like, my mentality a little bit more. Uh, casting True versus a laser, I think. Also, it just like it went okay. I think all the rest of the cast just went okay. And again, it was all ZVZs like for day two and day three, which really sucked. But that's sort of just the the way that things work. Uh, let's see. And after that, you know, I was done for the day after True versus the Laser. I was uh, got to like watch some of the other series, but I basically just got to hang around, chat with the other talent and stuff. But I didn't have to be on the broadcast anymore. Uh, that was the uh, first semifinals match, which I was super happy I got to cast the semifinals match. Yay! Uh, but yeah, there was a second semifinals match and a finals. I didn't have to do anything for us. I just kind of hung out in the crowd, uh, or not so even so much the crowd, just hung out in the player pit, like, uh, watching Scarlet ladder Protoss, which is always fun. She always does that when she loses that, uh, loses an event. Uh, she just ladders Protoss for like four or five hours. Uh, let's see. Just really hung around, talk with people. Uh, we finished up for the day, kind of did congratulations. Great job, everybody. Headed back, uh, everyone kind of went to the bar for some drinks and stuff, hanging around. Uh, I hung around for a little bit. I showed up like maybe a little bit late later because I like went and got changed and stuff out of my uh, not so much soup, but like collared shirt and stuff. I hung around, but I, I was just feeling really down. I really didn't feel like I did a great job uh, with the cast, and because of it. I think I just needed time to like reflect on my mistakes and everything and sort of bounce back. And I could, I could tell that I was, I was being extra quiet. I was being extra kind of depressing and I really didn't like the impact. I felt like my presence had on the group, excuse me. Uh, Cause I could see like occasionally someone was like, Hey, you okay? Like pig, pig asked me that. I think Nate asked me that. Someone else asked me that also like, Hey, are you doing okay? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's just sort of, I, I don't know. I, I didn't want to bring everyone down. So I just, I ended up heading back to bed a little bit earlier on. So I said my goodbyes cause I knew that I wasn't going to see most of them in the morning. Cause a lot of them had super early flights. Like Nate had to leave for the airport at like three in the morning or something. It's ridiculous like that. Esports life. Uh, so yeah, I ended up going to bed. Uh, I was able to sleep like relatively okay because I, I wasn't feeling nervous anymore. I was just feeling sort of down, sort of depressed, but uh, I was able to get some sleep. And let's see. After that, I kind of got up. I uh, ended up going to breakfast. I Smix just happened to also show up there at the same time, so I ended up uh, grabbing breakfast with her, as well as one or two other people that kind of showed up. Um, and we just ended up talking a lot. Smex is a super duper chill, down to earth person. She's super duper nice. And uh just like talking about a lot of other things. Like I kinda I I've I vented like for maybe a few minutes on like how I felt like I did a really shitty job and everything. She was like, Yeah, you know, I'm also really hard on myself, don't be too hard on yourself, etc. Which is helpful. Um I think just like talking with someone. Not even necessarily about like how I felt like I did during the broadcast, but just talking with someone really kind of helped like turn my mood around a little bit so i was starting to feel a lot better uh met up with neeb and let's see unintentionally again we just like saw happened to run across neeb nurchio john snow 
What other Zerg? A laser. A laser, yeah, because he just won. Um, so that was fun. Just hung around with them, waited until our flights took off, and then eventually my flight was going to leave, so I said my goodbyes and uh, headed out. That was it. Uh, so I headed back to the United States, 20 hours or like 18 hours of flying back. Apparently got sick and went to bed. Uh, so that was sort of my event. So the uh, kind of wrap-up conclusion, I learned a lot of good lessons from this. So I talked about some of them, but one, you have a lot less time to talk on the broadcast when it's a big broadcast of a lot of different people than you went on a community cast. A lot less time. You have to be much more focused. You have to really know what you're going to say before you say it a lot of time because you, you aren't going to have a lot of opportunities otherwise. Um, the second thing is, it's kind of related, but like being a cog in a machine. So when I do most of, most of my casts on my channel and stuff, like I'm the, I'm the producer, I'm the sound director, I'm everything. I'm the host, I'm the caster, and I'll have a co-caster sometimes that like is along for the ride. Um, and I've been a part of broadcasts where I'm a cog in the machine where there's an observer and like someone else doing production on the, usually the observer and like a co-caster or something. But usually there's still like a, a large degree of control for me myself. But when you're on a broadcast with six, seven, eight people, it means that you have to listen a lot to them and you don't necessarily get to build. You aren't as much a part of building that narrative. You're a lot of time, a lot of times, building on someone else's perception of the narrative. So you have to be ready to adjust your perception a lot. You have to be prepared for that kind of stuff. It's, it's not the same. It's definitely very different than uh, what I was normally used to. So that was an interesting experience. Let's see. Uh, I need to learn more about ZVZ because holy shit, if I ever get invited to cast another premiere event, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of ZVZs again. Just because of the existing talent lineup, probably getting preference and all that stuff. But let's see. Uh, and just generally being too stiff. I think that it was sort of me trying to be a little bit too professional on the broadcast. Uh, as well as just needing to work on my banter and my social relationship with those other people. Uh, that whole idolization thing coming back into effect where it's hard to work with someone that if you just put them on a level above you. You, it's hard on the broadcast to then treat them as an equal. You, you can't really have it both ways. You have to treat them as an equal all the time or it's, it's not going to work. Um, so there's a lot of, for me, learning about that. And I kind of knew it in the back of my mind. And I, I've been working on it a little bit. It could have gone a wor lot worse, I think. But uh, I still definitely have a little bit too much intimidation for just respecting them so much. Um, despite them actually, and this is the other thing that I learned is that everyone there is so goddamn nice. Everyone there was so freaking inviting. Uh, all, every single person there. Uh, Todd was insane. Todd is insanely nice. Uh, if you catch him at the right time and you're on his good side, like he is just one of the nicest people, I think. Um, kind of unexpectedly so, cause he, he comes across as like, you know, you always hear about like, Oh, he's very picky and all this other like weird stuff. But he was just such a incredibly genuinely nice person. I think in a lot of ways, um, he's, goes out of his way to help me and like talk with me and say like, Hey, how you feeling, man? Like he would say that you, I think before anyone else, he was the first person to like really talk with me and say like, Hey, you know, you feeling nervous or anything like, Oh no, you'll, you'll be fine. Like it's, it's going to go great. Blah, blah, blah like really just talk with me about and notice how I was doing. Um, Smix also insanely nice. She's like, I think Smix is one of those people that is very inviting in a social setting. So even though I was very quiet in a lot of those social settings, because I was still kind of getting used and introducing myself into the social dynamic, I would say some things, but like she would make me feel like I was a part of the group most of the time. Uh, even just with kind of, I guess like, like the small things where there'd be, like a group and like making making room to like sit sit with a group and everything or you know i don't know just like treating me the same as everybody else despite obviously the fact that i i haven't known her or she hasn't known me nearly as long as she's known everybody else and all that stuff or like work with them etc so uh 
Smix in control, of course, being very, very nice to me, uh, not like berating me or, you know, going hard on me with the, uh, the trolling just to make sure, because I think he uh, saw that I was feeling nervous and everything. And also just generally being pretty nice to me. Um, same thing with Nathanius. Nathanius gave me a lot of advice, which I wish I had listened to. Uh, kept telling me like, oh, you know, don't, you overprepared, man. Just like, you're not going to get to talk about all this stuff. Uh, and I wish I had listened to him. That uh, would have been probably good for me. But uh, Peg, of course, is just a ge genuinely very, very nice person. Um, so that was also very helpful. But uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Calaris was very helpful, uh, helping me get through like all the death segments and everything. Tried to toss me some of the easy questions and everything and talk with me beforehand. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember the people that I just ran through. If I'm forgetting anyone, Every, everybody was super awesome and super nice, including like the Blizzard staff and the production staff, you know, Wax Angel, etc. Um, but yeah, that is kind of the the lessons I learned. So from here, I it's sort of weird because I feel really, really unhappy with how I did. Um, I think it could have gone a lot better. I think it went it went very par for the course. And I think that's that's okay. It's a, I, it, it was an acceptable uh, quality level for the broadcast, but I think that the best way I can put it is I feel like everybody, the biggest realization that I had was that I think everyone on that talent broadcast has, it's like they have a superpower. Everyone has like this, this strength that they really own. Um, in control, of course, like it's the, it's the banter without a shadow of doubt. The humor and the banter, um, and of course, he just speaks so goddamn eloquently, like, absolutely top-notch. Uh, Pig, with, like, the high-level analysis, he lives and breathes the game, and uh, in every matchup, he just really has a good sense of all these small little subtle things that I think a lot of people would normally miss. Uh, you have, for example, like, Todd, who also has, like, a really high-level analysis of Protoss versus Protoss. Rotterdam, I think, has this weird, uncanny knack of being professional and unprofessional at the same time. He has such a relaxed feel about it. It makes you feel like whenever you're watching him, you're watching just like a broadcast with some friends. But at the same time, it still retains that kind of professional air of a WCS broadcast. Like, it's it's not easy to do that kind of stuff. And all these people have, like, these, these superpowers. And it made me very consciously aware that I don't really... I haven't really refined that. I think the way that I would describe it is a lot of these people, a lot of the community casters, it's almost like, uh, kind of, I'm watching an anime about like a superhero academy and stuff. So I just keep thinking of that, but like, it's almost like baby superheroes and stuff. There's semblances of a superpower that kind of like just is starting to appear, but it's not really like really come to fruition yet. You don't really know how it's going to, work or play out like i know my i know about most of my strengths and uh, like weaknesses like i know that i am stronger at play by play and i better at knowing and talking with the players and getting like the inside information and the scoops on that i feel good about that but it's not really to this i haven't figured out truly on like a wcs broadcast i know how to make this work on a community cast i think to some extent which i could still definitely improve on but uh on the premier commentary broadcast, I need to figure out how does that fit in? How do I directly contribute the maximum value to the broadcast? How do I really utilize the superpowers that I have? Um, it's still very rough and raw. And I think the same thing is probably true for like Zombie Grub or Wardy and Rifkin, and all these other like community casters and stuff um, that are upcoming in the scene. And it, it really just made me very aware of... Because people will always talk about, like, oh, man, you'll, you'll do fine, all that stuff. Like, I feel like I can hang with them. But am I really contributing anything? Uh, for example, I think Maynard is exceptionally good at building up the hype. Like, what, the way he builds up the hype is, like, I can anyone can scream and, like, get excited about a match and stuff. When Maynard builds up the hype, like, there is something very, very strong about it. And it, I think... I don't, it's a hard to, feeling to describe, but like it feels like a very manly kind of hype, like that deep, gruff voice, uh, the way that he, the, the language that he uses and everything, it gets you excited in a very, 
I guess like manly way, uh, you feel as though, wow, this, like, this feels very exciting, and I feel like this isn't just like a kids game or anything. It's not just like a couple of kids high squealy, uh, pitch voices and everything getting excited. It's like no, this is, this is epic. This is truly epic. Uh, I was a little bit sad that he wasn't able to make it to the event and stuff. Um, but. I think a lot of what I learned is I need to develop that superpower. I need to figure out how my superpowers interact. I have some, again, some ideas of like what my superpowers are, but I need to refine them. I absolutely need to refine them. I, I almost just don't, I don't know if I will get offered a gig anytime in the near future, uh, especially with how things went. It's like, if you don't knock things out of the park, it's always a little bit questionable. It's only four WCS events a year and with Montreal around the corner, I guess there's technically a chance I could get hired, but I have no idea. In all honesty, I'm not expecting to. Uh, but if I do get hired for another event, it probably won't be for another five, six months. Like, I'm <laughs> I am very, very confident in saying I will probably not be hired for BlizzCon. Um, that's way too early. But maybe a premiere event next year, 2018. So I have some time to work on things, and uh, I'm glad. I'm really glad. If it was just like back-to-back -back events, I think I'd feel a bit weird about it because I feel like I I realize I have a long way to go still. Um. So yeah, we're gonna try and take these lessons, move forward in the future, and try to improve because that's all you can do. Uh, I feel, honestly, I feel like a lot like a player that. I qualified for challenger like qualified for an event and then just bombed out in the first round uh i think that's actually a really good way of describing it is i feel like a player that qualified for group stage three the challenger and stuff and then just like went straight out zero four uh maybe maybe like taking a game off of like a good player or something and then going out so i think that there's still a long way to go but you know i qualified which is cool i feel somewhat good um We'll see if I can do it again. Not be a, a washed up caster already. But yeah, that was that was my first gig. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that kind of long, long diatribe about my uh, first experience as a uh, premier WCS commentator. So I, I don't really get to hear too many people talk about that kind of stuff. I went pretty in depth, but also I didn't, I don't know if it was super interesting. So let me know. If you guys thought it was if you guys have any questions feel free to ask them in the chat now i'm happy to uh, share them i see a couple of people in the chat that i recognize got mapu hey what's up man uh topher doll marsh steady go has been talking so much that after all this sounds like you identify things to improve on and time to do it in that's a good start but i need to put even more energy in time hey what's up ben yeah I think it's uh, it's gonna be an interesting road, and you know, I wrote a bl I wrote a blog on Team Liquid that Lycan actually dug up today somehow. I, I don't know how he found it, but uh, it was a blog where I just talked about it was 2016. It was before I even casted a offline um, event. I think it was February or February March of 2016, and it was right before I casted Kings of the North and Cheesadelphia. And I just talked about how I realized I didn't really have too many goals in StarCraft. And I kind of, the kind of big inclusion on that was I realized I, like, I want my goal to be to like, cast a premier event. And now there's this weird sort of place that I have to figure out where I've hit that goal. I need a new goal. And right now, all the goals I can come up with are very, in, I don't know what the opposite of in concrete is or concrete, very fluid they're not very uh, concrete goals and that's not a good thing I, I really believe in like having concrete achievable measurable goals and i need to figure out what that is because just improving that's not it's not great and i've gotten uh, like i've gotten into arguments with people about how i did turn the broadcast and everything so like it's not helpful if i just say like oh i, I, I want to do well abstract thank you ben uh abstract I want to do well, and if I just have an abstract goal, then it's hard to say if I ever meet it. Like, maybe I felt like I did, but 
other people didn't or vice versa, which is currently the case right now where I, I feel like I did a really terrible job and a lot of people are saying, yeah, you did great. Like blah, blah, blah. I got a lot of awesome. I got a lot of really good support from Twitter and I really am super thankful to everyone who did. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be different than I guess before I'm trying to figure that out. And maybe my goal is just to continue to try to improve and get a second gig and become a mainstay uh, commentator or something or get invited for multiple events in the year. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I don't think it's a bad room to have a lot of room. Bad thing to have a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, that's that's definitely true, Mapu. I think there's always room for improvement. There's always room. Uh it's a lot of the time just about trying to meet your own expectations. Nate saying once it's hard sometimes to get actual advice on improving because sometimes people are too nice. Gillyweed said something similar. Absolutely, that's that's super true. Uh, one of the big reasons I, I don't really... This is one of the big things is that I don't really trust other people's feedback usually. Unless it's like something I really respect. I usually don't actually listen to most feedback from the community or anything or Twitch chat, etc. And it's usually not because of like, oh man, I just don't give a shit about what other people think and all that stuff. It's like, it's, it's very difficult because one, people are not usually very good at giving feedback, honestly. Uh, it's very easy to just say like, oh, you should just do this. Like, this is just the solution, but you don't know about the reasoning behind it. And it's, Sometimes people just, if you don't have the reasoning and you don't have a concrete line of thought, then just listening to the advice is not always going to be good because you have to know the reason why you're doing something. If you're just making blind improvements, maybe you're making a blind improvement in the wrong direction. Maybe you're making an improvement that one person likes, but 99% of other people hate. And also the other thing is at the end of the day, and this is going to sound a little bit weird, but this is something I strongly believe you have to be happy with your own commentary you have to be happy with your own performance more than anything else because if you aren't going in a direction that you believe is going to be good if you don't know what the kind of big end game perception or goal of what you want your commentary or your your play anything else to look like then nobody does because Everybody has a different perception of what they think a good commentator is going to be or what a good, you know, desk analyst or et cetera is going to be. I feel like this is true in like just in general in a lot of parts, parts of life uh, that anything that doesn't have like concrete wins their losses um, or statistical numerical ways of measuring success uh, with this kind of stuff where it's more ambiguous you have to have an eye perception of what you want to be and just be constantly striving toward that goal. I think that's so, so important. Um, but yeah, that's a really good point, Mapu. Glad to see you enjoy your Valencia, uh, enjoy a Valencia. Well played. Saturday, I was present at DreamHack. I carried some posters and <laughs> Twitchy ones. Oh. Glad you had fun. Does it miss you? Artosas once said in an interview about his casting. He picked up he picked a caster he very much liked. Tried to imitate him if his style very much like his own. Yeah. yeah. Imitation is difficult. Um if you imitate too much, it can be difficult to find your own sort of style. I think that's a lesson that I had a lot of trouble learning in the beginning. Uh, day nine was the one who taught me that actually. Uh, cause I remember it was MLG Anaheim 2011. I was like going around asking for people on advice and stuff. Like, what do you, what do you think is like your best advice for up and coming content on the scene and stuff? And everyone was giving different advice. Like control was like, Oh, you know, having hard stats that, uh, if you're an up and coming commentator and stuff, like it demonstrates game knowledge in a way that is difficult to refute because it's not just about like opinions on matchups and stuff. It's like hard concrete things that like are undeniable. Uh, DJ Wade was talking about hosting and all this stuff. Dan and I was the one who was like, no, fuck, fuck everything that everyone else is saying. He actually said that like, fuck it, fuck everything everyone else said. 
cast for 30 days in a row. And this is how I actually got started with commentary and stuff. Um, cast for 30 days in a row, regardless, no matter how you feel and all that stuff. And the important thing about that is that you start to discover your own style. Like, depending on how you feel and all that stuff, like, just doing it repeatedly and not thinking too much about how other people think about your casting, that's how you really develop and find yourself in your commentary. Something I really recommend anyone that wants to get into commentary to do is to cast a ton before you really start worrying about comparing it to other people. Um, that was one of the biggest lessons I definitely learned because I think I would have gotten started down like a really wrong path and would have had a hard time finding myself and would have just been like a, a poor imitation of a lot of other people if I had to focus too much on it. I think once you do find yourself, that's when you can start looking toward others and finding ways to improve. Artosis is insanely gifted, uh, I think. I think he had a very good idea. And he also had a lot of strength in being a former player and stuff. So it is interesting, though, that Artosis kind of took that approach. That's not what actually what I would have expected. Oh, sorry, ham pants. I, uh, have I read Red Eye's book on casting? Yes, absolutely. I've read it multiple times. It's a great, great book. Um, read it multiple, multiple times. I uh, highly recommend for anyone else that wants to get into casting and stuff. I'm trying to remember the name. There are mindset books for out there for athletes. Trying to break down big abstract goals and smaller tangible ones. Marsh. Yeah, that's actually, uh, I kept mentioning the book Mind Gym. Um, that was the, those, some of the things that the, the book helped me with. Trying to break that stuff down and preparing for the event and everything. Uh, really recommend Mind Gym. I actually have, uh, it's somewhere behind my green screen. Um, I have a book signed by Artosis because he's the one who recommended the book to me, uh, which is super awesome. But yeah, I think that's going to be it. Steady Goa saying a lot of stuff. Get King of the Hill QXC first because he's the king. Oh, yeah. Man, yeah, Mind Jump. Mind Jump's awesome. I've actually get, bought multiple copies and given it away to players and stuff. I gave it one to... I like, I like to credit myself. Every player I've given one to has exceeded expectations and like for, or at least met expectations of how they thought they would do during the event that I gave them the book. So I give it to Jon Snow. Uh, Ray's also read it and at Dream Mike Austin. And Jon Snow made it to the playoffs. Ray's did exceptionally well and almost made it to the playoffs. Uh, game time ended up beating Thermal. Who's another one of the players I gave it to? Uh, let's see. I gave it to Probe this event. And he made it to the playoffs, which I, uh, round of 16, 4 0. And on top of that, almost beat Neeb, which is insane. Like, I don't, I'm not taking credit for it, but like, I think that's a great book. And I think it really does help. Um, and those are all short term things. I think in the long term, it helps out a lot more, also. And the community casters are closely tied to their partner, but you've had experience casting with a variety of partners. You feel it helped. When you got onto a bigger stage with casters, you had little experience with absolutely to all. Uh, it's very easy to get into a groove with one particular uh, caster or co-caster. And I think that that absolutely helped me. Um, a lot of people think about Zombie Garb and Rifkin as being very tied together. But I think Zombie Garb actually does have a good amount of experience with the casters. She's been casting a lot more with Rapid recently. And we've casted a lot together as well. Uh, I've casted a lot with Zombie Garb. Uh, she does very well, actually, I think, with other commentators. Um Wardy is another person who I think also does surprisingly well with uh, some other people. Not, I don't know if he does well with everybody. He doesn't co-cast very often, but he, I've always found the uh, co-cast I do with him to be very smooth. Um, but yeah, I think that that's pretty much it. Well, have a great night, Marsh. Uh, and yeah, have a great night to everyone else. I want to give a huge thank you again one final time to all the wonderful talent who made the uh, WCS Valencia experience amazing as amazing as it was I, mean, I really do need to cut this off it's past midnight for me now um i think it's almost been two hours for this stream i'm not actually too sure but uh big thank you to all the talent who were just insanely welcoming insanely amazing uh old boys club be damned there's i think with this i i finally say old boys club is dead like their old boys club had this implication that the top talent is trying to prevent new up-and-coming talent from coming up in the scene. 
And if that was the case, they would have been far less helpful. They would have they would have gone much less out of their way to help me out. And I could not be more thankful. So thank you very much, Smix, Pig, Todd, In Control, Nathanius, Calaris, Rotterdam. All of them are insanely amazing and awesome people. And I we're so lucky in StarCraft to have them. Um, <laughs> and a big thank you to the Blizzard staff also who did a fantastic job just taking care of us. And of course, uh, I'm hugely thankful for them giving me this opportunity. Um, Mark Olberts, who the one who kind of, I think was the final say on hiring me and stuff, as well as all the other people inside of Blizzard who I think uh, advocated for me. Uh, Adrian Harris, Kayla, uh, Artem, all really fantastic people. But... Thank you guys so much, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Oh, and uh, I, if you guys want to see a My Life in StarCraft video, where I just I do the whole rundown thing, because I technically promised it, apparently, in the blog that I wrote last year, that one that I mentioned, I said, I kind of conclusion I want to cast a premiere gig, uh, then let me know, because right now I'm under the impression that I don't think many people would actually care, but if people actually do want to see it, then I'll, I'll kind of do the preparation and do it. But uh, yeah, thank you all so much for watching.